We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Times Square on October 17th, 1980. It was written by Jacob Brackman, based on a story by Alan Moyle and Leanne Unger, which was in turn inspired by a diary found in a second-hand couch which featured a young, mentally disturbed woman's words and drawings, but hopefully not her name, since she isn't credited anywhere. It was directed by Alan Moyle, released by Associated Film Distribution, who so far this year have released Saturn 3, The Changeling, Can't Stop the Music, and Raise the Titanic. Still to come this year from AFDR Borderline, Inside Moves, The Jazz Singer, and The Mirror Cracked. The title of the original script by Alan Moyle and Leanne Unger was She Got the Shakes. During the editing of the film, Alan Moyle clashed with producer Robert Stigwood, who reportedly wanted dialogue scenes removed and replaced with more musical sequences so that the accompanying soundtrack recording could be expanded to a double album. Moyle refused to make the cuts, so Stigwood fired him and made the cuts himself. The original cut of Times Square contained lesbian content, which was mostly deleted from the final print and replaced with songs deemed inappropriate by Moyle, as they had less to do with the story he was cultivating and more to do with Stigwood's earlier works. I think that makes a lot of sense. I was sensing a lot of relationship stuff that was not coming through in the story. Yeah, and a lot of oddball music choices, mixed into really great music choices. The version of the film released to theaters was not Moyle's preferred cut. However, he still acknowledges the finished film's importance as it documents a Times Square that mostly no longer exists. The film was shot on location and captured Times Square's CD grindhouse atmosphere before it was cleaned up in the mid-1990s. An out-of-business radio station was used as the location for both the radio station, WJAB, and Pearl's political headquarters. Curry filmed all of his scenes over the course of two days and still earned top billing on the film. Susan Olsen, a.k.a. Cindy Brady, auditioned for this movie, presumably for the Pamela part. We open with stage light font credits over New York's Times Square at night. Nikki lugs a bunch of music equipment past a leering, drunken crowd along the sidewalk. She walks past several posters for a 1970 West German film called Cry Rape, a.k.a. The Brutes. Coincidentally, Peter Caulfield, who plays Pamela's father in the film, starred in a TV movie of the same name, Cry Rape, though the film and TV movie are unrelated. We see a group of men carry a model of someone's plan for a future Times Square enclosed in glass, a plan that essentially came to be over the next decade. Times Square went from being a crime center to family-friendly pretty quickly. Nikki eventually sets up her shop with her music equipment in an alley behind a club and starts playing for nobody. Her guitar playing is syncing up with the chords of the soundtrack until a girl comes out of the neighboring club's rear entrance to tell her that her playing is shit and that they can hear it inside. Not only that, but you're playing shit. Oh, playing shit, huh? Yeah. Plus, that's the owner's car you got your thing on. Not only that, but Nikki has placed her amp on the boss's car. Nikki is excited to learn that this is the boss's car and proceeds to smash out its headlights. We cut to Commissioner David Pearl being introduced to speak at a conference with the goal of cleaning up Times Square. He starts his speech with an anecdote. Recently, his 13-year-old daughter asked to see One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Now, I've seen the movie. It's a good picture. I don't care if she has to lie about her age to get in. After all, I'm a liberal. I, I wasn't sure about who this was at first because like, I was like, is he campaigning to be a mayor and this is part of his platform? Uh, but also, there's like only like 15 people it's yeah. like, who's he talking to? Who are these people? I think it's, they're literally just collecting investors. Mm. But he's already the commissioner. He's not running for office at this point. But he is not trying to lose the office. But apparently he had no problem with her seeing this movie, but he took issue when he learned that she'd be seeing it on a theater on 42nd Street and 7th Avenue. He said, the movie may be rated R, but that neighborhood is rated X. 
Pamela can't listen to any more of this speech and mumbles it's not true to herself repeatedly as she stands and runs from the stage. Unclear exactly how much of the story her father has fabricated, but she doesn't appreciate being made a prop in his political theater. Nikki is being loaded by police into a squad car without her equipment and feigns an asthma attack to evade arrest, but it doesn't work. We cut to way overhead, and Tim Curry's voice narrates the dark traffic of the city. There are eight million stories in the big city. People say I have a bird's eye view, perched up here night after night looking down into the uh, throbbing, pulsing, main line veins of the city, looking right down into the heart of the beast. Yes, it's story time. This is Johnny LaGuardia. It's that kind of night and that kind of feeling. Here, he starts by singing the Dragnet theme. Is that the Tums theme? (laughs) It's, It's both. And then by paraphrasing the closing narration of 1948's The Naked City. There are eight million stories in The Naked City. This has been one of them. He reads a letter he received from an adoring fan, a young girl. As he reads the letter on the air, the camera floats across town to Pamela, listening. It's her letter. Her mother is long dead, and she hates her perfectionist father for what he demands from her. She has no friends or skills. She is asking for Johnny LaGuardia's blessing to be a zombie. LaGuardia tells her that she has a seed of something strong deep inside and that she should nurture it, in spite of how terrifying that may be. But the last section of his advice is the part that makes me uneasy. Yeah, the part about jumping? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You may have to jump off into the darkness. How desperate they feel those moments before you jump. But sometimes you just got to do it. You gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you gotta jump. And we cut back to Pamela listening to this broadcast on headphones, but she's looking a hundred stories down from her apartment to Mm -hmm. the street below. It kind of reminded me of the opening of The Fisher King. Yeah, Uh, I I was thinking that too, actually. We see Nikki in the back of an ambulance lighting a cigarette when a nurse points out a no smoking sign. Nikki doesn't care and the nurse knocks the cigarette out of her mouth and then she spits in the nurse's face before laughing. I think it's her social worker. Because we see this character again. Oh, right? yeah, I yeah. guess it is. Apparently, between the last scene and this one, Pamela suffered a seizure that we didn't see. But as a result, she's being led into a hospital for a checkup. And her father is leaving her here alone to attend a previous engagement. I think, so this was really confusing to me. That if there was a seizure and we didn't see it, did they actually even say she had a seizure? He says something about seizures when he's walking her in. Okay, that, that's why I think I tested. missed that because I was so confused. I'm like, did they just literally bring her in here because she ran out of his stupid meeting? Yeah. And it's, like, it's like, you know, let's medicate this girl before she causes me problems. Like, that's what I thought was happening. So, like, it was really confusing to me. Well, it, this whole thing, like, I don't understand. I understand this is a hospital. But I don't understand why her and Nikki are sharing some kind of symptoms that they would be roomed together because it would be more convenient. Yeah, because we didn't see us either one of them suffer a seizure, but we're being we're being told that that well, she suffers from them. When it's Nikki, it's Nikki, right? Yeah. So when Nikki was getting arrested at the beginning of the film, she did say she suffers from s- something. Like she was trying to tell the yeah. cops, like, oh, no, yeah, I have yeah. a condition. I have a condition. You can't do this to me. And they were like, yeah, Which just right. came across as, I don't want to get arrested right yeah. now. But yeah, Pamela's sharing this room with Nikki Murata. And they're here for the same test, but Nikki doesn't want to meet her roommate. And so the nurse just yanks open the curtain around her bed to forcibly introduce them. Later, Nikki is listening to I Want to Be Sedated on a small radio while Pamela tries to read a book. For a few years, the soundtrack of this movie was the only way to purchase I Want to Be Sedated. Wow, really? And so you can only get it on the the double soundtrack for this movie. Hmm. Pamela's father enters with doctors Zemanski and Huber. The doctors tell Mr. Pearl that she has a clean bill of health and they have one more scan to do. While Pamela ignores the doctors chatting, she is watching Nikki in the opposite bed eat flowers out of a vase on her bedside table. She asks them if she's going crazy while they answer, blaming her condition on hormones. Nikki knocks the vase to the ground, shattering it. 
Dad is very mad that the other girl is here. Pamela asks specifically not to be moved to another room because she actually likes Nikki and likes the company. Back at WJAD, Johnny LaGuardia's radio station, a producer enters with notes from ownership that the story time quote of the day is too Jewish. Hands that help are more holy in the eyes of God than lips that pray. They struggle with rewording it for a moment and hand Johnny their update, and he changes it again to... A helping word is like a prayer. A helping hand is an answer to that prayer. They're blown away by his brilliance, but this whole scene is completely unnecessary. I don't even know what they're trying to accomplish. I don't either. They're, they're just trying to write some kind of copy for him. I'm not even really sure of the format of his show. Yeah. Uh, it, he seems to do some kind of special interest stories. Yeah. But um, he also has stuff that's recorded. Yeah, this feels like plays. his moment of zen or something. They're just trying to make use of this character because he was top billed and they advertised Tim Curry as being in the movie. Dr. Zamansky sits with Nikki and asks if she hears voices. He makes her say a few words, Massachusetts, Methodist Episcopal. He asks her to explain the saying, a rolling stone gathers no moss. As she says, rolling stones don't need moss, they're rich. The last phrase he asks her to translate is, out of the frying pan and into the fire. And Pamela interjects, out of the frying pan and into the fire is where you go when you don't want to be eaten for dinner. I actually like this interpretation of the phrase. It hadn't occurred to me before she said it. Because usually the point is, well, the frying pan is bad, but the fire is much worse. And then Pamela's version of it is, well, if you're going to die either way, you might as well deprive the person that's killing you of something to eat. That night, Nikki and Pamela chat about their lives. Nikki asks why Pamela is here, and she is hesitant to answer. I don't think the answer is a seizure off camera. More likely the reason is a deleted scene. I'm guessing some kind of an argument happened between her and her father, or that She's literally here for being a lesbian. Yeah, it's so much of this movie doesn't really make sense. Like they because don't, of how it's chopped up. They, yeah, they took out so much, I feel like, that would have explained the really the strain in the relationship between her and her father and yeah. and why she was seeking outside help. And so in, instead of these scenes that actually like meant something in terms of character development, we just get so many montages of running around the city. Yeah, yeah. I almost wonder if the story of her going to see once upon a time was a cover for the reason, the real reason she was down in that part of the town. Oh, interesting. Like, like they were trying to play it off. It's like, Oh, she was in that part of town cause she wanted to see a movie. Yeah. And that's why she's saying, no, that's not why I was there. Like it's there to meet chicks. Yeah. Nikki says she's here because she lives fast and she doesn't expect to make it past 21. Nikki tells her not to take any of the pills. The hospital gives her Pamela writes something in her book. Johnny LaGuardia puts a song on the air and his producers come in to hand him a stack of papers. Nikki sneaks across the room and reads out of Pamela's book at night. She tears out a page quietly and reads it to herself under her blankets with a flashlight. Poem for Nikki Murata. Tiny fossil bones. Translucent skin. Million-year-old eyes. Dinosaur, you don't belong here. They'll kill you for your tiny tusks. But your ribs are my ladder, Nikki. I'm so amazed. I'm so amazed. Johnny LaGuardia reads a news story picking on Pamela's dad on the radio just by coincidence because he's a public official. In the morning, Pamela finds that Nikki has been discharged. The woman here to collect Nikki takes her eyes off of her for too long and she manages to escape. Nikki runs back to Pamela's room carrying her boombox, blaring I want to be sedated throughout the hospital. Which I thought she was going to use as a distraction, like like she was going to like put the radio somewhere and then go the opposite direction. No, rather than just use it as a constant location device. Come find no, me. It's, it, I think it was actually the opposite. I think she was using it as like a beacon to get um to make it, yeah her excited. You mean no to get the other girl to come out because they moved her into a different room and she oh, didn't know where okay. she was. But did they have that kind of relationship yet? Like I think she really liked the poem. I think she was touched by the poem. But 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 was playing this song enough for Pamela to go, oh, there's Nikki. I have to go find her. Uh, it's like, possible there's another conversation that we missed here. She has a very strange gait to her walk, though, as she's moving around the hospital. And the hospital staff seem completely incompetent in their efforts to apprehend her. She finds Pamela and asks her to run away with just hand gestures. They're playing charades here. And Pamela's reluctant, but they end up escaping together. 
They steal an ambulance outside the hospital and drive away. They crash it through a gate arm, and You Can't Hurry Love starts playing, which I felt like was out of place with the other songs that we've had. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, But I also agree, like, all right... I have a problem with the fact that she just so readily jumps in a stolen ambulance. Like, I feel like at that point we made a really big jump. Yeah, because we've been setting this character up as, oh, she's a son of a rich guy. Everything's she's really proper. straight laced. She's edu- well educated and, and she'll do what she's told and all of this stuff. And then all of a sudden this girl makes some hand gestures, gets her to leave the hospital together and is is now a, an accomplice to Grand Theft Auto. And she's 100% <laughs> on board with everything yeah. that happens moving forward. And driving into oncoming traffic. Yeah. Just- They're bo- both just laughing through it. Nikki asks again what's wrong with Pamela and she says they won't tell her. They both don the paramedics jackets that they find in the cab and Nikki says, They ain't never going to tell you what's wrong with you. I get my revenge. Nikki drives the wrong way onto a freeway off ramp, and cars are swerving around them and hitting each other as the siren on the ambulance blares. They manage to get back over to the right side of the freeway and just drive for a long time. On the roof of WJAD, LaGuardia reads a notice that the zombie girl he gets letters from is both the daughter of Commissioner Pearl and also missing from a nearby hospital. On the subway, Nikki insists to Pamela that they can be self sufficient together without anyone else. Nikki has an idea where they could live together. They walk into an abandoned warehouse and climb a spiral staircase to a platform crowded with chests full of clothes or something. Nikki thinks they can sell this stuff. A lot of sleaze up here. Sleaze sisters. Nikki finds a functional sink and they start making a room for themselves in the abandoned building. Then they slit their wrists. Yeah. (laughs) To make a blood pact. Don't you usually like use a finger? Or the palm palm. I've seen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Nikki pulls out a switchblade and she she just straight up nicks the vein at the bottom of her wrist. And uh, they hold hands to become blood sisters. And Nikki tells Pammy that if she ever gets lost or scared to just shout her name as loud as she can. And so they just do that back and forth for a while. Pammy's dad speaks with a team of people from his work that he's assembled to try and find his daughter because the police aren't cutting it. He's accusing Nikki of kidnapping her because she has a lengthy arrest record that they've somehow gotten a hold of. One of the men intends to circulate photos of Pamela to help find her. And then someone enters the office to tell Mr. Pearl, hey, uh, the news of your daughter's disappearance is already on the radio. Yeah. Because it turns out this radio program has fans all over the city. And so people are reaching out to him with information. Uh, I also love uh, uh, Pearl's reaction of, how did this happen? And then he turns around to look at his, at his aide again. The aide guy goes, ah, I don't know. <laughs> like, it, it's such a weird delayed reaction. Yeah. Back in their flop house, Pamela is reading Nikki T.S. Eliot poems that she has memorized, and Nikki is not into poetry. Pam tries to explain her understanding of what poetry is. It doesn't have to rhyme. It doesn't even have to be words. She tells Nikki everything she does or says is poetry. LaGuardia barges into the studio to take over the broadcast with an important message. Evidently, this power is written into his contract. He speaks directly to the girls over the radio. A storytime reporter has seen your records from New York Neurological. And what they boil down to is this. There's nothing medically wrong with either one of you. Well, figure it out for yourselves, girls. Either those doctors don't know what they're doing, or they're lying through their teeth. The most important thing the True Squad found out is that you two sweethearts have a favorite song. But it's not a song we've heard before. It's not a song right. that's played yet. I assume this would be I Want to Be Sedated because they've played it twice now in the hospital. The next morning, Pammy surprises Nikki with food that she stole. The girls start washing windshields for tips. Pammy gets a tip, but the car drives away from Nikki before she can get a tip and she kicks it in frustration. Later, Nikki is running a three-card Marley game. Pammy plays a sucker and loses. And someone leans in and steals all their cards and cash before running off just as the cops show up. I, I believe I believe the thing was for her just supposed to win. Right. To lure in other people to go, oh, I guess this is a possible thing that can happen. Yeah, but they played it off like she was supposed to lose. But then she also, like the way you would be playful with someone who lost money, like, oh, you were supposed to win, dummy, or something like yeah. that. Like, that's what you would say to the person who you stole their money, too. Also, anyone who sees people doing that. Like, you have to know... How do you this... crowd around and start throwing money at them? Yeah, exactly. How, how do you not know this old scam? 
A plainclothes cop chases them through traffic, mistaking them for boys, but they run into a porno theater. They make it up to the roof and then down another set of stairs to get away from the cop. They steal a pair of wigs from a wig shop that's evidently doing well enough to just sell wigs on a street corner. There's lots of shops like that. Yeah. I mean, the Shine Heart Wig Company. <laughs> Shine Heart, of course. I just thought it seemed like a weird choice for like a corner store. Um, seems like something that would be like a boutique somewhere in a in a mall somewhere. No, I nope. don't think. Have you been to like downtown Los Angeles or New York? These kinds of shops never, are all never over. Never been. Never heard of it. <laughs> well, because there's all kinds of theaters and stuff in the area. I guess that's true. And like, so I guess having some of those supplies on hand. Yeah. That night, they try to mug a guy with a gun, but Nikki has a little blooper right when she starts it. Pamela blocks the guy asking for directions, and then Nikki runs out and says, Freeze, motherfucker, I'll bring your balls out. I mean it, bitch, freeze. You laughing at? You said bring your balls out. <laughs> and when she realizes what she said, they laugh so hard that the muggy is able to just escape without them noticing or caring. We cut to a strip club where the Blondells play as a woman dances. Nikki talks Pammy into applying as a dancer. The guy tells her that there's no benefits, dancing is topless, and boyfriends stay outside. Pammy has a bold new approach to stripping where she intends to keep all of her clothes on. And the guy's like, all right, that sounds great. That sounds very classy. <laughs> uh, he asks if she's 18 and then if she can prove it, even though she's going to stay fully dressed, so it's kind of irrelevant. The club DJ introduces her, and she takes her time coming out on stage. She moves very slowly at first, and most of the club are laughing at her, but she warms up to the music and is happy when she sees Nikki straight ahead. She dances awkwardly, and the club owner smiles, shaking his head. But when he sees Nikki, he realizes that he needs to amend to the club rules that girlfriends also wait outside. Well, I think that this could have been a nice opportunity to establish that relationship more you know with like her and the club owner or no 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 with 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 pam and nikki and yeah. just have you know like instead of because when she gets up there she, or like her dancing is is goofy and silly and i guess i guess it's childlike but i, I you know i thought that the, that could be a moment where like they connected with each other and because she was dancing for nikki mm-hmm. you know she danced better she danced well she she danced seductively yeah when she's in full swing, everybody in the club is into it, and they're all clapping along. Back at WJAD, LaGuardia reads a letter that he received from Pammy directly. I was asked simply to read it on the Where air. Are here? It is written in a firm, round, girlish hand that I believe belongs to Pamela Pearl. Quote, Dear Daddy, I am not kidnapped. I am me napped. I am soul napped i am nikki napped i am happy napped doctors lawyers indian chiefs we are looking after ourselves and having our own renaissance we don't need antidepressants we need your understanding unquote this is johnny laguardia on wjad They dance down the street to Talking Heads Life During Wartime. The girls pop into an adult film store and are immediately thrown out. They find a bus with Pamela's face on the side. Somebody graffitied the word Sleaze Sisters on it, and Nikki takes a marker and blacks out the eyes on Pamela's picture. On a slow day at the strip club, Nikki reads Pamela a poem she wrote. I won't recite it here because I couldn't understand what the actress was saying, so I'll just cut in the audio. Damn dog, by Nikki Murata. I can lick your face and I can bite it too. My teeth got rabies, made too hot for you. I'm a damn dog. No arms, no words, just a taste for danger. So I phone and chew the hands off a stranger. A damn dog. You feel my fever? Can you hear me howl? I'm an evil genius. You better throw in the towel. Just a damn dog. Sit. Sucks, right? You know, it's kind of like a song. She introduces Nikki as, what is her name, Aggie, Aggie Dune? Yeah, something like that. And she's singing with the strip club band, The Blondells. The song is not great, <laughs> but it's it gets stuck in your head. And and I thought for a moment that the the playback was skipping, 
when she does like two encores no, of like just the final has, chorus. She yeah. ends the song three times. Because I looked away for a hot second and 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 then it repeated. I was like, oh, did did I what hit? I, I looked out at the keyboard and I was like, did I, did I hit Why back start somehow? Over? Like, do I go yeah. back 10 seconds? One, two, three, four. <laughs> But the crowd is going wild for this song. They really like it. Mr. Pearl's assistant plays him recordings of WJAD to piss him off. It's mostly LaGuardia encouraging the runaways to stay runaways and picking on Mr. Pearl for being a terrible father. A call comes in with the location of Nicky Murata and he says, I'm going over there. What about the police? No. Mr. Pearl grabs Nikki off the street and takes her down some steps to interrogate her. He says she needs medical attention, which we've basically determined already isn't true. Nikki asks how come he couldn't stop Pammy's shakes if she was able to, but I don't remember any scene so far where Pammy had a seizure with Nikki, other than maybe the first dance at the club. Pearl starts slapping Nikki around and just Christian bailing her. Where is she? Where is she? The time has come for this to stop. You trying to con me, shit face? Where is she? Where is she? Why don't you hit me again, huh? Hit me with your fist. You're a big man. Come on. We cut back to Pearl's office where three co-workers write a hit piece on Nikki with the intention of somehow delivering it to Pamela, I guess through the papers because it's an open letter, but we haven't seen her reading the paper much on their adventures. We cut right to both girls reading it. <laughs> <laughs> An open letter to Pamela Pearl. Pamela, I care about Nikki too. Nikki is ill. First of all, I need to know who this letter is from because none of the people we saw writing it care about Nikki or know anything about her. Well, I'm assuming it's coming from the social worker. Yeah, but the three people that we see in the office with him writing it seem to be just employees of his own. Correct, yeah. So they're with the social worker. Um, uh, who's, I have her name here. It, it's at the end of the letter. Rosie. Yeah. Uh, and Rosie is like trying to say like i don't want to write these things about nikki that aren't true yeah but they're all we need to we need to make sure that they know that she's dangerous we need to communicate that she's dangerous to pamela the next part says she has what is called a thinking disorder often she cannot tell truth from fiction pamela has been living with this girl for weeks and we've seen no evidence of such a disorder yeah yeah, this is the uh joe versus the volcano brain cloud yeah exactly that means she reacts impulsively and violently We also haven't seen this violence either, except for Mr. Pearl so far. Her tolerance for frustration is low. So is mine. She's dangerous to herself and others. So am I. (laughs) Auto theft is not what Nikki is wanted for. This is where it gets interesting. She will probably face manslaughter charges in the drowning death of her friend Sharon. Enough is enough. Get her to turn herself in before she turns 17. And loses the benefits of the juvenile system. Sincerely, Rosie Washington. I'm not sure why she would let Pammy read this whole letter (laughs) if she had a problem with it. I think Nikki should have just taken it out of her hands at the beginning and been like, oh, screw these people. They don't know me. Yeah. She does admit that people die on her all the time and that her friend Sharon OD'd. And when she tried to wake her with water from the river, something went terribly wrong. But she doesn't really specify beyond (laughs) that. I threw her into the river. Yeah. (laughs) I pushed her off the bridge so that we could wash her off. We never saw her again. Sank like a stone. <laughs> but she didn't gather any moss. That's yeah. true. <laughs> she might have. <laughs> we cut back to the radio station where Nikki and Pamela have been invited to perform a song with exclusively racial slurs for lyrics. Ugh. And it's live. And why the police and her father don't go to the radio station I know. immediately, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. These are words that Pamela says she has heard her father use behind closed doors. So she's trying to tank his political career, basically. Why would they let them 
play that song on the radio. They we, didn't do anything. It's just Johnny LaGuardia trying still, to ruin the radio station. And and if I and, and if I were the radio station owner, I'd be like, yeah, you're fired that's because true. I just got an FCC fine that is so huge I will never pay it off. Yeah, he should not have still been working at the station at the end of the movie. That's true. Was Howard Stern in operation during this time? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, like, what what could you get away with in that time? Again, considering his time slot is like two to four in the morning. Yeah. But one of the other DJs jumps into the booth with LaGuardia and he's like, is this going out live? It is. Later, we see Nikki and Pammy sleeping together as a boat passes their home and toots its horn. Finally, Mr. Pearl heads directly to WJAD, which he should have done like yesterday in the middle of the concert. And he accuses LaGuardia of aiding and abetting. He asks where his daughter is and LaGuardia asks, Does she want you to know? She's a child. She doesn't know what she wants. Tim Curry finally Tim Curry's her dad into throwing him at a wall. He's just trolling Mr. Pearl now. Where is she? Ooga, ooga, ooga. Kill you, you fucking bastard. I'll kill you! He attacks LaGuardia a final time before a producer steps in and tells Mr. Pearl his daughter works at the Clio Club. Well, why Why this? Why, why did he tell him? Why did he tell him? Because he's a producer. He's not Johnny LaGuardia. He doesn't give a shit about these kids. But also, I but I, but I think that's wrong. <laughs> because I feel like Johnny isn't telling him... I don't know if he cares about these kids because I think if you cared about them, you'd want to make sure that they were safe and taken care of. And he's leaving them in in potential danger. And who is Johnny is Laguardia. He's he is aiding and abetting them. Like I I don't think the dad is wrong here. I don't think the dad's wrong except when he says she's a kid. She doesn't know what she wants because she's thirteen. Sure, sure. but. I think that Johnny just wants a story out of this. Yeah, for sure. Oh, That's yeah. true. Mr. Pearl goes to the club and he sees his daughter dancing to Lou Reed's Take a Walk on the Wild Side. Lou Reed, who we had earlier this year as Steve Cunelian, producing partner of Rip Torn's Walter Fox in One Trick Pony. He watches her for too long, like he's Klaus Kinski and Schizoid or something. She runs away when she sees him and he does not follow for some reason, even though his daughter's been missing for weeks. <laughs> The Sleaze sisters push something heavy in a box. They get into a freight elevator to the roof of a skyscraper and push a television out of the box and balance it on the edge of the building. Pamela is the spotter, but they aren't being super careful before they dump it over the side of the building and it explodes between pedestrians on the sidewalk. Yeah. What is she spotting? Because she says go and there's people down there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because this is the one that's the closest to anybody yeah. of all the TVs that hits. And there's no way of knowing when someone's going to come out from underneath one of those awnings. Yeah. Or... You have too much time before the TV well, hits the ground. And the time between when she said now and the time at which it actually went off the ledge yeah. was a couple of seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't like this whole no. plan because I don't get what they're trying to do. Yeah. Aside it's like from attempted murder. Yeah, Project Mayhem nonsense. But what are like we don't get a clear idea of of their message and their connection with other fans i guess like th- there are p- supposedly people listening to this radio yeah. like broadcast and and following their stories and supporting them but we really don't see that at all until the end of the movie yeah i i mean i think it's just supposed to be a very simple anti-capitalism anti-materialism protest where it's just like Oh, we're destroying I pop culture by breaking they television. They don't actually talk about any of that stuff. So, yeah. like, their views on this stuff isn't super clear. And again, that's probably because so much dialogue was taken out of the movie and replaced with music. We get a montage of just TVs plummeting to the ground and exploding on sidewalks. LaGuardia fields calls from people commenting on the work of the Sleaze sisters, and he encourages them. And for some reason, it's always, like, children yeah we're calling into the radio it is station. weird because it's if it's on the air from like 2 to 4 a.m i don't know why the average caller age is like 11 yeah yeah and i get i guess that they're they're identifying with these with these characters but it's not like it's not abundantly clear who they are what they look like and like it's not it's not like these are on like the television news this yeah. is a radio station so yeah. like i feel like it's weird that kids are glomming onto this yes it is very weird LaGuardia says the switchboards are jammed 
could do anything you want. Keep doing it for all us. Stay at home. Pamela is getting worried about Nikki's carelessness. She steps out to phone her dad and let him know that she's okay, that she's not being held against her will, but that she's not ready to come home yet. No, I can't. Not yet. Nikki needs me. Nikki plays electric guitar in their bedroom at night, and Pammy worries that they will crash soon. Nikki has her heart set on a big Times Square concert. Nikki thinks that LaGuardia is only with them for the fame, and Pammy says he doesn't care about that stuff. Well, I think you got the hot for him. You know, you can be so ridiculous. You think I'm an ignorant moron. Don't be stupid. Okay, so now you think I'm stupid. You are being stupid. Nikki storms out with her guitar and makes a phone call to LaGuardia, who shows up at the apartment with a bottle of vodka. This would seem much less like a To Catch a Predator episode if they hadn't cut out all the lesbian scenes. I guess, but also, I don't care if maybe, like, okay, it's not super clear that he's not after something here. Yeah. Because he showed up to an abandoned building where two underage girls are hanging out and brings a bottle of vodka. But you still showed up to an abandoned building with a bottle of vodka for underage girls, even if you weren't planning to, uh, you know, sexually assault them. Yeah. It's weird. It is weird. Johnny LaGuardia and Pammy drink together while Nikki wanders the city. Pammy tells Johnny that she isn't a zombie anymore. Nikki overhears their conversation and storms in jealous of their canoodling. But she set this up. Yeah, she called him and said to come out there, but she's still allowed to be upset about it. She lectures them for their behavior. When Johnny tries to interrupt, she just throws a huge bottle across the room, which explodes. She continues hurling things at them until Johnny pulls Pamela out of the room and they leave. Nikki breaks all of their trash alone in the apartment. Nikki paints a bandit mask on her face and tears out all the pages of her poetry book and lights it all on fire on the roof before diving off a ledge into the water. But it's not like she can't swim or anything. She's able to swim to safety from the water. Yeah, uh, on the Wikipedia page, it described this as an attempted suicide. No. And I was like, I don't know if that was an attempted suicide more so I, than I, just jumping in the water. Or I falling. kind of took it as such until I saw her swimming out. And I'm like, oh, I guess she wasn't killing herself. Yeah, because I thought this was going to be a moment where Pamela hears it somehow and goes to help her. And they start doing that screaming for each other thing that they set up at the beginning. Yeah. Um, or or we do a flashback essentially to her and her uh, friend and her friends over overdosing situation and but it's you know like reversed but this time there's a you know a uh, a savior moment that actually yeah. you know was transformative and this is not it's not good johnny and his producer play speed chess until nikki barrels into the studio and demands to be put on the air put me on the radio live and I right now and you watch it and let me know to tell me what you want to say first you fucking little straight I'll pulverize you! And then she throws a big bottle of liquor through the window of his recording booth and completely shatters it. And I guess he's, like, impressed by this because he just says, Okay, we're going to do it. Simon, give her a mic. Plug her into an amp. Johnny introduces Nikki Murata and she starts into a guitar riff and then she says a little poetry. Her mask is running down her face in tears because it's just a makeup mask. She says... I never told you everything. I never said the stuff I should. I was chicken to tell you. I never thought I could. Find me, help me, save me. Can you hear me? The radio staff pull her away from the microphone as she screams for Pammy. But Johnny actually cuts her off, like, yeah. after her first line. So, yeah. like, he puts her on and then flips the switch to pu- pull her off, and then the guys come in and drag her Because he doesn't like this one. He's on- He only has the hots for Pamela. Well, I think that the story is in the other one. The yeah. the rich girl that's on the streets trying to make a point. Like, not this one. Johnny heads back to their place, and now it is a different mess. He wakes Pammy, sleeping on the floor, and they head to the hospital to see their friend together. She seems medicated, and Pamela blames Johnny somehow. You only care about yourself, you faker. It feels like I give myself away every day for a living. You give other people away for a living. This actually seems to cut him. She says she hates him, and she takes Nikki back out onto the streets. They head to her father's office, where she pulls out a phone book and calls WKVL to give them the scoop over W whatever, that, where Johnny works. The scoop being that they're going to be putting on a concert. Yeah. She's posing as Nikki for this call, and she says, Yeah, well, I'm not repeating this, so get this straight. This is Nikki Murata, a famous murderer and entertainer. 
I'm throwing a concert tonight in Times Square. Celebrate my escape from mental illness. Don't miss it, asshole. So now she has confessed to murder <laughs> as her friend over the phone. So hopefully they weren't recording this. But uh, if they were, then that'll be Exhibit A in the trial. We see a montage of people hearing about this free Times Square concert, including a DJ who sounds an awful lot like Wolfman Jack, though I could not confirm that he appears in this one. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the DJs in this montage sound familiar. Yeah. Uh, uh, including, but why would Wolfman Jack... Be on the East Coast? Yeah. I don't know. There's going to be one big party tonight in Times Square. And I have no idea if this was actually him or just someone trying to sound like Wolfman Jack. What year was American Graffiti? 75? Something like that. Maybe earlier. Johnny encourages listeners to wear garbage bags and bandit mask makeup to the free concert. Does he say that? Because I was so confused when everybody showed up that way. Yeah, he says something about, oh, put on your best trash bags for the the garbage show or whatever and, and, and black out your eyes. Yeah, I was so confused. Okay, because this is what I was thinking earlier when they put the, um... Uh, when they blacked out the the picture on the side of the bus, I'm like, yeah. well, this is like the first time we see it, but like all of New York is not seeing that that one that bus, one bus. <laughs> yeah. and they are not. Let me repeat, not on television. They're on the radio for this entire thing. Yeah, and she just blacked out her eyes like a couple hours ago and yeah. jumped off a bridge, and now they're all runny. But everyone seems to know exactly what they look like. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even know how. Uh, I mean, aside from having seen her come into the studio how he would know that he should be telling everyone everybody do this on your way to the concert and everybody wear bags but they all do it and they call the bags sleaze bags there's people selling them outside of the the show a massive crowd forms it's all composed of young girls yeah and even here on the precipice of the concert nikki seems unsure that it will happen and she thinks even if it does that she's going to blow it pammy still has to talk her into it we see a quick clip of, the, and this is totally unnecessary, but we see a family's kitchen as the kids are heading out in trash bags and the parents suddenly notice their TV is missing from the window. It's like, this shot should have been way earlier in the movie. Yeah. They're not still doing that. They're not stealing the TVs anymore. LaGuardia watches the concert from his perch high above the city. Pammy's dad shows up to see the show. LaGuardia introduces the show on the radio as the triumphant return of Aggie Dune, a.k.a. Nicky Murata. Nikki and Pammy step out onto the marquee of the Times Square Theater. The band all pops out from under blankets on the next marquee over, and the crowd rallies beneath them, chanting, Go for it! Go for it! Go for it! Nikki stands and kicks off the show. She gets more comfortable as she speaks to the crowd. I got really worried when she said, I like it up here! (laughs) Must stay up here until they blow me away! especially after earlier when she said she wasn't going to live past 21. Um, She says she doesn't care because she's a damn dog, and the Blondells launch into her only song, as far as I know. Uh, I hope that she does at least an encore for this crowd. The cops crowd her on the marquee, and she pleads with them to let her say one more thing to the crowd. I know a girl named Pammy. She taught me a lot of things about life. real smart she knew a lot of things she knew one thing long before I ever knew it that was that she was the best friend I ever had and then Nikki absorbs a hailstorm of bullets no she (laughs) dives off the marquee into the crowd and they shepherd her to safety as Pammy just laughs her way to jail (laughs) Uh, dad sneaks up behind her and they stand here together on the marquee as the credits roll and I that's don't, the end of our film i don't understand because they didn't have those conversations nope they didn't have any meaningful conversations she never said anything about you're my best friend and i'm your best friend and yeah they, they don't they don't talk about much at all because no. of how much got cut out but what they left in was so unnecessary yeah and this movie didn't need to be what was it like an hour 44 yes it could have been it could have been 90 easy you want to hear the crazy part about this what's that i watched the credits and i kept backing it up there was like there was 11 sound editors and like 12 people credited as assistant editor and then like another eight 
like editorial PAs. Like they had the largest editorial crew I've ever seen on a That's film. Very weird. And it is the, <laughs> the worst cut movies. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. I feel like it definitely got chopped up a lot. As we said before, the director and story uh, came from Alan Moyle. He also directed Pump Up the Volume, which also centers around a radio DJ, and Empire Records. He directed that. And uh, a movie I really like called New Waterford Girl. I love Empire Records. Like, that is angsty teen done right. Yeah. You well, know, I mean, in a, in a 90s way. I mean, a, a, there, but there's angsty teen done right in the 80s way with something like, you know, Little Darlings. This 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 had, I could see how it had bones of good stuff under there. Um, like I would like to see the Moyle cut, if that exists yeah. somewhere. <laughs> No, Richard. No. No. Uh. <laughs> they definitely couldn't call it that on the Blu-ray. <clears throat> Writer Jacob Brackman befriended Carly Simon when they worked together as camp counselors. Consequently, he has written lyrics for one or two songs on almost all of her albums, and most of his IMDb credits are soundtrack credits. He also wrote The King of Marvin Gardens before this, and One Law and Order. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all of his screenwriting credits. This, King of Marvel Gardens, and A Law and Order. He also executive produced Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven. The other story credit was for Leanne Unger. She was the partner and co-writer of uh, director Alan Moyle. Uh, this is her only story credit. Everything else is musician and sound engineer credits and things like Pump Up the Volume, Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken, The Limey, and the George Clooney Solaris. Tim Curry played Johnny LaGuardia. He's Frankenfurter. He's Wadsworth and Clue. Lots of Clue people lately. Uh, he was Pennywise in the It miniseries, Homolka in Congo, Dr. Petrov in The Hunt for Red October. He's the concierge in Home Alone 2. He's a bunch of characters on Dinosaurs. <laughs> I was yeah. looking it up. I didn't realize how many characters he played on that. He's also Long John Silver in Muppet Treasure Island and The Devil in Legend. Don't there worry. you go. I, I was going to say, you can't leave that it. out. Uh, he also does many, many, many animated character voices, including Prince Charles on Tiny Toon Adventures, Thaddeus E. Clang in Tailspin, Captain Hook in a Peter Pan animated series, Taurus Bulba in Darkwing Duck, Conk on Pirates of Darkwater. Uh, he does voices in the Aladdin and Little Mermaid series. He's King Acorn in Sonic the Hedgehog. He's Mal on Captain Planet. He's Dr. Anton Severius in Gargoyles. Yeah. He's Palpatine and Darth Sidious in Star Wars The Clone Wars. And my absolute favorite, he is Hexus in Fern Gully. Oh, yeah. With an incredible soundtrack. Slime beneath me, moon. Slime up above. Ooh, you love my... Oh. Toxic love. Trini Alvarado played Pamela Pearl. She's Meg March in The Little Women from the 90s that was directed by Jillian Armstrong, the director of My Brilliant Career. Uh, she's also Lucy Linsky, the love interest of Michael J. Fox in The Frighteners. Yeah. Robin Johnson was Nikki Murata. She's the punk girl in After Hours, which seems on brand for her. Peter Caulfield played David Pearl. We'll see him again next year in Only When I Laugh. Herbert Berghoff played Dr. Huber. He's Rivitowski and Harry and Tonto. And Theodotus and Cleopatra, we just had him as Dr. Fooldauer in Those Lips, Those Eyes. He's the guy that really wanted to work in theater again. Yeah. Became the security guard. Yes. And then he shot the, <laughs> or alternate ending of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a gun! Or he's got a knife. That's what it was. David Margulies was Dr. Zemanski. He, this is his third appearance this year after Hide in Plain Sight and Dressed to Kill. He is New York's mayor in Ghostbusters 1 and 2. Uh, I also want to mention that I recently saw him in a short film, uh, I believe that Danny DeVito directed, called Curmudgeons. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a wonderful short film, and I highly recommend uh, if you can have the means to watch it. Take a look for it. Uh, Anna Maria Horsford played Rosie Washington. She was Mrs. Jones in Friday and Friday After Next. She's Mama King in How High, and she plays Casey in Minority Report. She was also Dee Baxter on the Wayans Brothers series. J.C. Quinn played Simon. He's Jim in Barfly, Sonny Dawson in The Abyss, and Duncan in Maximum Overdrive. And lastly, Elizabeth Pena 
was the disco hostess. That's the girl who comes out of the back of the club and says, you're playing shit, and that's the boss's mm-hmm. car. She was Johnson in Rush Hour. She's Rosie Morales in La Bamba, and she's the voice of Mirage in The Incredibles. Helen? Hello. You must be Mr. Sinclair. She was helping me to escape. No, that's what I was doing. Uh, I wanted to bring up the uh, DP, James A. Contner. He uh, did Cruising uh, as the director of Oh, okay. Cruising. That makes sense. Um, They're both too dark. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, he was the DP on a lot of things. But uh, he also became a television director. Uh, a lot of Josh Joss Whedon stuff, which is why I recognize his name. Oh, okay. He directed an episode of Firefly. Um, Bunch and- of Buffy. A bunch of Buffy, and he directed one of my favorite episodes of The X Files called Soft Light, which is the Tony Shaloub, uh, where his shadow envelops people. Oh, is that at the train station? Yeah. Yeah, where he uh, stays where there's lights everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that he doesn't hurt people. I really like that episode. Yeah, I think we've detailed our problems with the movie pretty yeah. much. I think that the movie, whatever this, mo- whatever was cut out of this movie, would have been a good movie. And the Nikki character, they basically like got off the street to play this yeah. part yeah um obviously this is her first role in anything and i think she does a pretty decent job i think her acting is is wonderful i mean it's, she's hard to understand at some point but yeah the the whatever cut we watched was hard to understand a lot of the things that That's were being true. said but but there was a, there was some really nice dialogue pieces in there and i'm like there's there's a story in here it just we didn't explore any of yeah. the most interesting parts of it it reminded me of um, Natural Born Killers, where there's just pop culture is rooting these two people on to just sabotage their lives and do crazy stuff for mm-hmm. everyone else's amusement. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen that one? No. I think you would like it, actually. The Oliver Stone? It's Oliver Stone directed, but it's written by Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. And, it, well, and I was getting some, like, girl interrupted vibes. Sure. And... You know, and and I think that those are stories where they're doing it better. You know, yeah, they're, definitely. They're explo- they're exploring the interesting part of people going through you know psychological, uh, you know, trauma in their life and yep. and the consequences. Up or down, Jess? It's a down. Yeah, it's a big down. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a big down for me. I and we've said it a couple times. I I, I would have liked to have seen. Well, also, I feel like the the quality of the the print that we were watching wasn't all that great. That's true. Um, but I mean, I don't think that, that it, I don't think that, that it would have been better. I don't think that there is a better version. Yeah. I, I think that, that this is the best that it's going to be yeah. in circulation now. Cause yeah. it's just been too long and no one, no one talks about it. Yeah. Editor's note here. Kino Lorber is actually releasing a 4k Blu-ray of Times square. Uh, it's scheduled for this year at the moment, but the way titles have been, moving around on the calendar lately i wouldn't be surprised if it's early 2021 or mid 2021 but either way kino lorber's on top of things but so it is a down for me as well and uh what are we thinking list wise jess it's pretty low um i i don't think that this is the kind of movie that i'd ever need to watch again um and as much as i love tim curry in just about anything you could put him in um like we didn't use him really well here. Yeah. Um so I have it at 119. Uh <laughs> it's it's low. I had it at exactly 119 but I moved it up just now. You did you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like I maybe I'd move it up. I don't know. I I did I never thought that the relationship between the two of them rang false. Although I do agree with you that it does these leaps where we go from her being an experience free kid in this rich household in the top of a skyscraper to suddenly like, yeah, cool. Let's steal this uh, ambulance. Sure. Let's drive it the wrong way on the freeway. Yeah. All right. You, you, you convinced me to, to raise it up a few. It is going at one Oh nine. Okay. So it is below resurrection and above the first deadly sin. Okay. And Richard, where do you have this one? Um, I've been I'm moving it around now a lot, <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I'm going to settle. I'm going to settle on 81. Okay, uh, which puts it below Honeysuckle Rose, uh, but above Melvin and Howard. Okay, um, I have it at 105, which is just below Oh Heavenly Dog, which it's actually very similar to if you don't think about it, <laughs> and above the Private Eyes. 
I think that's everything for this one. If you guys had any thoughts you wanted to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing It's My Turn, which IMDb describes like so. A successful but stressed mathematics professor goes to her father's wedding and falls in love with her father's bride's son, a prematurely retired pro baseball player, and must choose between him and her current boyfriend, between Chicago and New York, and between research and administration. We leave you now with the trailer for It's My Turn. There's only one thing wrong with Kate's life. She does everything right. But she never knew what she was missing until she met Mr. Wrong. Why are your clothes so dumb? You're dumb. I'm a ball player. You're gonna get it this time. You are gonna get it bad. I'm ready. Jill Claver, Michael Douglas, Charles Grodin. It's my turn. Rated R. Coming soon to a selected theater near you.